Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition or episode of the Hare Krishna Project podcast. This is episode number 129. A big thank you to everyone who stuck with us for 129 episodes. Uh, I cannot, I can't quite believe it that we've made it this far. Um, do not forget if you're watching this on YouTube, if you haven't already, to hit the subscribe button. And also if you're watching this on Facebook, if you haven't already, to hit the to, to click like or follow. It means via YouTube or via Facebook, you can be kept updated about future podcasts and video productions from the Hare Krishna Project. As you know, I, ap- I appreciate each and every one of you tuning in on a regular basis. Okay, as you know, I love to have a range of guests on this podcast because I love to meet devotees. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest this week. It's Jagannath Ishvari. Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. It's great to have you with us, Jagannath Ishvari. We were just chatting before I hit the record button. And I was kind of saying, and I say this to guests often, that I've known of your existence for some time, um, which kind of sounds a bit spooky, like I've been stalking you or something, or, you know. (laughs) But I've known of you for some time, and I'm delighted that uh, you're going to be our guest this week, because um, I'm really excited, as I'm sure the viewers at home are, to hear your story. Um, So... We're going to kick off with a nice, easy question. It's the first question that every guest gets just to warm us up a little bit. Um, Please tell us a little bit about you and where you are from. Okay. well, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm from the UK. I was born in a village called Castle Donington, which is in Leicestershire in, in the Midlands of England and um, yeah I was um, my father is a was was a school teacher a a deputy headmaster of a school Um, yeah nothing amazing just a little village 1950s and uh, I went to grammar school and then I uh, went to university and uh, yeah, what else do you want to know? Just out of interest, what did you study at university? Um, I studied literature. Wow. Wow. Um, and I think you're an author, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I always do research about guests before I interview them. <laughs> um, we can talk about that a bit later on, actually. Um, so yeah. 1950s, you you grew up uh, in... Uh, or, appeared i hate that word, born appeared in 1950s england in the midlands uh your your uh, father was a teacher um how did you uh, did you you, sorry before i ask you that did you have kind of a religious upbringing in any way um no my parents were not particularly religious um i was i was kind of religiously inclined myself as a child I used to I used to pray I used to go to Sunday school I was kind of naturally religious but then I kind of lost when I became a teenager I I just kind of rebelled against it all and and went a bit crazy as a teenagers do and um until um when I was in university I started I became a vegetarian and then I took up um, meditation and then I started to get into spirituality again at that point wow interesting uh, I'm quite intrigued that even though you didn't have a religious upbringing you chose as a child to go to Sunday school um, my my mum often tells me or sometimes tells me that she went to Sunday school as a child just so her parents could have my grandparents could have Sunday mornings co- uh, bit of quiet at home uh to get my mum out of the house. So that's why my mum and my auntie went to Sunday school um okay um so we're kind of heading towards possibly you meeting the devotees you you became a vegetarian at university you took an interest in meditation at what point did you meet the Hare Krishna devotees and how did all that happen for you 
Um, okay, so when I was a student, I was at the University of Essex in Colchester. I met a devotee on the street in Colchester who gave me a record, a long playing record of uh, various bhajans, and including the Hare Krishna mantra. So I started uh, listening to that from time to time when I was alone. And um, and then the second devotee I met was in Nottingham. Um, I got a Krishna book and I started reading the Krishna book, which I found very intriguing. And then um, eventually um, I was at a music festival. Uh, this was just after I'd graduated and um, the devotees were there doing Harinam. And I, um, somehow or other, I ended up jumping into the their van and going to back to Adanta Manor. I spent the night there, went to Mongolati, and that's how I was uh, introduced to Krishna consciousness, although I didn't actually join at that time. Um, do you want me to tell you the whole story of how I joined? Yeah, that? I'd love to. I'm also, uh, one thing I've got... Uh... I'm guess I'm keen to know. Do you remember the first devotee you met in Colchester and who that was? Um, no, I, I, no, I don't know who that was. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, please share the story. I'd love to hear it. Okay, so I had already at that point um, when I first visited the temple, I'd already planned to go to India because I was on a sort of spiritual quest to find my guru, and. Um, and first I went to, uh, I, I was going, I was going to go overland to India. First of all, I went to France and I spent a few months there um, living alone. And I was, um, I started chanting, reading the Bhagavad Gita, doing some fasting and all sorts of things. And, um, and then I went to, um, I was quite interested in Catholicism also. And I went to visit a, a convent, but they, I got disappointed because the nuns there, they were all eating meat. So that put me off. And then um, and then the next place I ended up was in, in, um, in Rome, in Italy. And I visited the temple there. And I spent three days in Rome visiting the temple and I met a very nice devotee there who kind of took me under her wing. And that's when I actually made the decision to become a devotee uh, of uh, ISKCON. Wow. Uh, I still didn't actually join right there in, in Italy because I, I still wanted to go to India. So I traveled overland to India, got on the magic bus in Istanbul to Afghanistan, went through Pakistan wow. um, into India, and then I visited the temple in Delhi. Now, my plan was to travel around India and visit different holy places, and then I would join. But what happened when I got to Delhi, the devotees told me that Prabhupada was in Vrindavan, and they were all going to Vrindavan and said, come, come to Vrindavan, come and meet Prabhupada. So, so I did, and um, landed in Vrindavan, and then my desire to go elsewhere disappeared and I stayed in Vrindavan. Wow. Your desire to go to India, um, was, was that independent of, or independent from an interest in Krishna consciousness? Um, well, it was a kind of general spiritual mm. desire to you know, to find some kind of spiritual path, to find some kind of meaning and purpose and goal in my life. So um, although I already knew about Krishna consciousness, I had met, I'd seen devotees, I'd met people who knew devotees, but I didn't really know enough about it to to make a decision. So I, was, I was just keeping my options open because I wanted to make sure that I would find the right path for me. Wow. So you uh, got to Vrindavan after kind of traveling via Europe and catching the bus from Istanbul. That must've been wonderful. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I do, I drive often. I, 
I, I drive sometimes around parts of Europe. I've never thought of traveling all the way to India via the land. I mean, I, personally, I, I can't take that much time off of work. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and if I did, it's kind of like, wow, it, it just would take, what, several weeks, I guess, to do that. Yeah, 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 quite a few weeks. I mean, some people used to do that in those days, but it's not so common nowadays. So. No. And which year was this out of interest that you did this? Um, this was 1975. 1975. So you then met Prabhupada in Vrindavan. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a bit about that experience? What happened? Um, well, the first time I saw Prabhupada was in the temple, the Krishna Balaram temple, which had just opened the previous year. And um, I came into the temple from the from the side of the Pujari room, and Prabhupada was right in front of the altar of Radha Shamsundar, and he was he was praying and offering his obeisance, and you know he offered his obeisance, and then he was standing there and taking darshan and praying, and um, it was. It was like a revelation for me to see him. And I just felt that I found my spiritual master. Mm. I mean, he was so effulgent and so pure. And um, he was just my spiritual master. And I, I felt that I recognized him. Wow. And then at some point you uh, uh, were initiated by Prabhupada? Yes, four months later. Wow. Was was that also in India? In Vrindavan, yes. Amazing. Yes, I was very fortunate. Yeah. Can you remember the day well? I mean, what what, what was kind of going on in your in your mind that day? And tell us a bit about what happened around your initiation day. Uh, well, there were quite a lot of devotees getting initiated, probably about um, 30, 40 devotees, maybe, in the courtyard of the Krishna Balaram Temple. And um, so we were all sitting there. And um, I mean, it's hard to remember now the details of that, but obviously it was a very special experience Mm. very very special to be accepted by Prabhupada as his disciple um was the most amazing experience in my life and uh probably for many lifetimes actually so it was um really really special yeah wow well thank you for sharing that um yeah, I always love to meet Prabhupada disciples and to kind of hear and find out about your experiences. Um, just out of interest, so I have I have Rancho, your godbrother Rancho Prime. I have his book here, um, When the Sun Shines. And he talks about uh, the early days of ISKCON in the UK. Uh, and there's a list of Prabhupada disciples at the back. Are you on that list because you were initiated in India rather than England? Um, I'm not sure, but in that book, um, there's a a little story about uh, my father meeting Prabhupada, actually, yeah. Oh, wow. Which happened at Bhaktivedanta Manor. Wow. It's it's funny you just mentioned that, because I was thinking, I wonder what... Jagannadeshwari's parents were thinking or going through when even though you were not a child and you were a young woman when you went to India and you were initiated but I just wonder what were they what was what were their thoughts that you joined this kind of Indian group thing uh, well of course they didn't know what to make of it um, but when I went when I returned to England I mean I used to write letters to them and, and tell them I, I hadn't remembered that these letters but just recently um, my father passed away and um, my brother gave me like a box of like a box of papers and it had my name on it 
and he gave it from my father's house and he gave it to me. And there was lots of letters in there that I'd been writing to him and to my mother and like preaching to them, you know, about Krishna consciousness when I was in India, when I was mm. in Vrindavan. Mm. Um, but they, I guess they didn't know what to make of it. But when I, when I arrived back um, the following year, at the manor, then my father came to the manor to see me, and um, he couldn't find me, but somehow or other he found Prabhupada. He went and he kind of joined. Uh, there was some journalists and guests going into Prabhupada's room. He tagged along and he went in and sat down and um, spent some time there, and they had some conversations. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I've just, uh, yeah, I love to hear devotees' stories of of how they joined the movement. And um, I can imagine that your parents were thinking and feeling in the 1970s, they didn't know what to make of it. Uh, you know, my parents in the noughties 20 years ago didn't know what to make of it then, even though society's moved on a bit now. But I can imagine in the 70s, it was even more seen as something quite alien and, and foreign and cultish, because it certainly wasn't part of our christian culture whatever whatever that means um they were quite open-minded i mean relatively speaking because they were not particularly religious yeah. so they were um they were open to finding out more about it I mean, I, well i suppose they had mixed feelings about it but they appeared to be to me quite favorable um but they but it, i mean they must have had big reservations but you know it takes time for them to um get to understand a bit more about it and and to accept it um, mm. which they did not for themselves they didn't accept it for themselves but at least for me they were they were okay with it yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just to let you know your camera's kind of shift that's it that's it oh. uh don't worry um and, and just out of interest what did your father think of Prabhupada do you remember what he said about that meeting yeah, he was actually very impressed with Prabhupada because he was um, he because Prabhupada was very personable and friendly. He wasn't like aloof, you know. He he had friendly conversations. He was asking my father some questions about English culture and sort of to make him feel comfortable. So that was nice. It made Prabhupada feel, it made, sorry, it made my father feel comfortable with Prabhupada and I think more um, than comfortable with me being a disciple of Prabhupada. Yeah. Because often, and some people, um, this is my personal opinion, that some people try to paint Prabhupada as this very ultra conservative type figure. And I'm, I'm sure at times he, he was. And he is definitely, but also he was this loving, inclusive personality. They just wanted to accept everybody and everyone to feel embraced by Krishna consciousness. And I can just imagine Prabhupada having a conversation with your father and just that kind of two gentlemen having a, a conversation, you know, of, of mutual exchange and mutual respect even. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Which is which is wonderful. Um, so we're gonna come back to talking about Prabhupada a bit later on, uh, which is good, uh, and, and generally the Hare Krishna movement. But I want to talk a bit now about um Krishna marriage. Um, because um, as I said to you before we hit the record button, I've known of you for some time. And I remember being at a national, an ISKCON national council meeting several years ago when you came to, I'm pretty sure you came to give a presentation about Krishna marriage. Uh, and I remember thinking about it then in terms of, this is a very interesting project and you've been on my radar for some time to interview, but unfortunately it's taken me 129 episodes to get to you. Um, so I'm keen, I, I I know you're not involved with Krishna marriage anymore, but I'm keen to know a bit more about it in terms of what is Krishna marriage, the initiative, um, and what is its purpose? What does it do? How does it benefit people? Kind of that kind of thing. Excuse me. Okay, okay well, it started um, <clears throat> when um, the 
the leaders, or rather the, the then temple president of the manor, asked me if I could take up this service. It started with just like, you know, they have brahmacharis and brahmacharinis, and some of them want to get married. Well, especially amongst the brahmacharinis, they were concerned because brahmacharis are not supposed to want to get married, of course, but um, those who are graduating from that to the next ashram or whatever. So this temple president was very concerned um, about these girls wanting to get married and he wanted someone to help them. And he asked me and I was actually, I was quite reluctant to take this on. I think it's very difficult to find someone who will take on this service of matchmaking because it's a big responsibility and it can go wrong. Um, but since there was no one else really wanted to do it, so I thought, well, this is this is something that's much needed. And uh, okay, let me just take this risk, take this responsibility, try to help out. And it started there, but then it spread out. Because then once I'd taken it up, then I was, um, then I just had to figure out for myself how to do this. You know, so I just made some forms and got them all to fill in the forms with their information. But then how am I going to find husbands with these girls? So then eventually I thought, well, I think I, ha I have to make a website. So, so I got some help, got s someone who was able to... Um, write the codes and make a like customized website for devotees to find spouses and it just sort of gradually expanded from there wow and then we built a team you know i started off on my own and then um and then a few more other devotee couples they joined and uh, we developed a team we developed a website and, you know, from that website, then there was another system <clears throat> that we changed to and then another new website after that. So it's been through over the years, starting since um, 2008 was when the first website was built. And then I was carrying, I was involved in it up until um, last year, 2023 when I just um, decided to resign and pass it on to the next generation. Wow. So you set it up uh, and you, you ran it for 15 years by the signs of it. Yes. Um, which is a long time. Well, it, it's not in the grand scheme of eternity, but it is in our lifetimes, isn't it? Mm. 15 years kind of running a project. Um, so, so Krishna Marriage is an initiative where uh, uh, two people in the Hare Krishna movement, uh, they, they instead of, uh, how do I say this, instead of approaching each other directly, they will call on the help of senior matchmakers to pair them up or to... Yeah, but the thing is that because... Um... You know, because once we had a website, then, you know, obviously there was hundreds of devotees registering, signing up and, you know, a small team of matchmakers. It's it's very difficult for us to personally do do matching. So eventually um, we, we were trying to make a system where they could actually find each other. Um, although at the same time, a lot of devotees, they, they didn't even feel comfortable to do that. Some of them, they didn't even want their profiles to be on. Of course, actually, the profiles were not were not in public. They were not in the public domain. All the profiles were visible only to the matchmakers. But this was the difficult thing because, because then it was all on us and it was... Mm -hmm it was just too much work for us to cope with, to be able to keep up with looking after every single devotee who was registered on there. So I, I made in the beginning like a dual system that the ones that they could either search for themselves, they could have their profiles in public and they could do their own searches and contact each other 
like a lot of other marriage websites do, or they could have a different um, kind of system where it would be like a private introduction system, and then they um, then they could have like uh, private matchmakers. Um, but it's been developing in different ways. Um, it's been a lot of a lot of experimenting, but it, it's a service that was very much needed because because devotees are spread all over the world in little pockets. And and if they want to marry a devotee, um, it's difficult for them to find a, a, a compatible partner. So that's why this service was very much needed. Uh, but eventually I, then, you know, I, I got to the point where I felt that it would be nice to hand this over to someone else because it was getting too much for me. It mm. was it was a lot of responsibility, a lot of management involved, managing the team, um, the administrators, the matchmakers, trying to keep it all together, take care of all these devotees. So I felt that, you know, it'd be nice if there'd be someone else who could help or I could pass it on to. And then eventually I managed to find um, some nice devotees who were interested to take it on of the, the next generation. And I felt that, you know, because I, you know, I'm obviously getting older, so it's time to pass it on. And then I could, um, because also in my heart, I really wanted to focus primarily on writing and um, preaching. Mm. In terms of, because I'm, I'm quite keen to find out more about this Christian marriage thing, um, is it? In terms of the stats of the last 16 years or the 15 years that you were running it, how many couples did you pair up and how many marriages came about as a result of Krishna marriage? Um, not a huge amount, actually. And that that's another thing that makes it difficult um, um, because, you know, People can be very fussy, you know, <laughs> very particular. <laughs> and, um, you know, you it, it's, it can be quite frustrating because you can be searching for a match for someone and you, you keep offering them match after match and they're like, nah, nah, not this one, not that one. And it's, it's really hard, you know. Mm. So, um, I mean, there were some successful matches which helped to make it feel more worthwhile, but not a huge amount. Um, we were getting about a couple of matches every year like that. Yeah. Mm. I remember, um, if I'm honest, when I first heard of Christian marriage many years ago, I was a bit unsure about it because I'm from quite a liberal Western background where, you know, how do I say this? It's appropriate on a podcast. If you're interested in someone, you go and talk to them or you ask them out on a date. And all of a sudden I joined this movement where we don't really do dating, <laughs> you know, or, or, or not in the same way that in, in Western liberal culture. Um, and I, I, it was just kind of a new thing to me. And I, I guess I saw it as, I don't know what's the correct term to use. Could some people perceive it as kind of arranged marriage? Um, really. Some people, I mean, you could call it that, but I mean, I wouldn't call it that. What what we were doing because um, basically, it's you make an introduction, you suggest you suggest a match, and then they meet up, they talk to each other, and they decide if they want to go. The decision is theirs. We don't make any decisions. We don't say we don't push anyone. Say, I really think you should marry this person. You know. Yeah. Um, cause that would be a big mistake. And especially if it was to go wrong, that would be a mm. huge, and, and I always felt very strongly that devotees should be free to make their own choices when it comes to marriage. Very, very important. Yes. Cause it's a very important commitment, isn't it? Being married decision to make, um, and ideally you should have been married once if you're going to get married at all. And therefore you want it to be right the first time mm, um yeah. 
particularly a lot of people who spend thousands of pounds on a wedding. <laughs> um, and just out of interest, in terms of the demographics of the people on the database and the people that have been through Krishna marriage, is it, uh, so they're, they're Hare Krishna devotees. Are there a mix of Westerners, as in Caucasian devotees, as well as Indian body devotees? Yes. Yes. And um, we tend to get more Indian body devotees because mm. um, because they're more sort of into this way of finding a match. Um, yeah. So I that's why I passed it on to the uh, the Pandavasena. <laughs> oh, great! With their energy and enthusiasm, to yeah. Um... Yeah, so they came up with some new technology and it's all been modernized. And so I'm quite happy they, with them. Let them just flow with it now. But we have the same name. Yeah, Krishna Marriage. And they've probably developed an app or something that you can have on your phone and flick through profiles. <laughs> I know. I don't... Yeah, that was, that was the plan. I'm not sure if they have yet, but it's definitely in the pipeline if they haven't. Well, I know um, a number of couples... Uh, not a lot, but I know a number of couples that have been involved with Christian marriage and they have had success. So um, I know it's brought a number of people together. So mm. it's it's obviously been a worthwhile service that you've done. And obviously it was, it was and is very well needed, very much needed, yeah. um, you know, because certainly in kind of Vaishnav culture, it's, there's, uh, you know, relationships are meant to be very deep, very meaningful uh, not just not just based on whether you find someone physically attractive. There has to be something much deeper. Well, all, all relationships should be based on something much deeper than physical attraction. But obviously, it's a, it was it wasn't as a much needed service because you know that such a service didn't exist before. Um, not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and it's now global, isn't it? It's global. Yes. I mean, there are there's quite a number of. Um, ISKCON marriage websites in India. But as far as I know, Krishna marriage is the only one that's based in the West. Great, great. It's, um, it's an international service, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we're going to kind of change track again, uh, and we're going to quite rightly go back to talking about Prabhupada. I was just keen to talk a bit about Krishna marriage because... I've never talked to anyone about it on this podcast before, and I knew that you were the ideal person to um, to talk about it. Um, so let's talk a bit now about Prabhupada and the Hare Krishna movement. Uh, you've been around the movement for quite a while. Um, uh, I, I often don't like to say how many years or, or point out the number of years because I don't want people to feel of a certain age, you old. know, old, <laughs> God, I'm trying to be diplomatic here, but, um, you know, 1975 was quite a while ago. So you've been around the movement for some time um, and you've seen many things, you've experienced many things, no doubt. Uh, and no doubt, no doubt you have your own opinions on things, which is great. <laughs> I'm like you, I'm all for people making their own decisions and having their own choices. You know, I, I, I don't want to be po part of a robotic movement where we all think the same and dress the same and behave the same. You know, um, it's tell me just, about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm an individual for a reason. Mm. Um, so what are your thoughts on uh, the modern day Hare Krishna movement? Uh, you were around when Prabhupada was physically present. And thankfully, you're still around now. <laughs> um, so tell us a bit about your thoughts on the modern day Hare Krishna movement, ISKCON, the development of ISKCON, and whether we are actually still following Prabhupada's teachings and ideas. Um, well, um, I mean, the, the movement is going on. Prabhupada wanted it to go on, to expand. It's expanding. Um, you know, there are many great initiatives. There are many great projects, centers, temples, devotees. And um, so, I mean, we have to see the positive side of it as well. I don't want to just talk about Absolutely, yeah. 
the negative side. Um, I mean, not that there's a negative side, but just that, um, you know, to answer that question properly, I would have to say that I feel that things are a bit out of balance in terms of um, the sort of Indian Western kind of um, connection. So, I mean, everyone's aware of this, really, I think. I mean, most devotees are aware of this if they've got their eyes open, that um, the movement is growing very well in India, which is great. Um, in the West, it's still do it's doing very well in certain places. However, um, it's there's a lot of uh, a lot of the new devotees are from Indian background, and a lot of the congregations are of Indian Hindu background, and. Um, this is not exactly the way Prabhupada wanted it to go, as far as I understand. Um, like in his pranam prayer, which is very well known, that you know that he actually composed himself. He outlined his mission. Namaste Sarasvati Devi Goravani Pacharine. So the the. Uh, the preacher, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarina. His mission was to deliver the Western countries from impersonalism and voidism. Paschacha means the Western countries, and that means the Western people. And he very much wanted Krishna consciousness to be taken up by Western people. This was his mission. That's why he came to the West. And so um, the problem is that, um, I mean, I think that one problem is that the Indian culture, in, like in terms of, especially in terms of dress and um, or other cultural things like music, food, um, dance, architecture, everything, it's become very much Indianized. I mean, I mean, I love Indian culture. Indian culture is wonderful. It's, it's the most ancient culture and beautiful culture. But the problem is that if we um, stick to Indian culture and if we portray ourselves as being um, followers of Indian culture, then we're there's, there's a huge amount of people that who are not going to be attracted, that who could be attracted to Krishna consciousness. Um, if that was if that wasn't there so heavily um, um, promoted, mm. because um, it's it's good for attracting uh, like Indophiles, people who are interested in Indian culture. And you know there are a lot of young people who like kirtan, and they they attend the kirtans, and that's nice. But I feel there's still a huge swathe of people out there who who are not actually being affected, who are not actually being brought in, because um, when they see, you know, devotees wearing Indian clothes, chanting in the streets, and you know all these temples which have become known as hindu temples then they feel this is not for them it's a hindu thing it's an indian thing mm. it's not for them whereas krishna consciousness i mean Prabhupada stressed it many times this is not a hindu movement this is not an indian movement this is international that's why it's called iskon it's for the whole world krishna is god he's the god for everyone he's not just the god for indians but a lot of people now are under the impression that Krishna is a Hindu god and it's for Hindus. And this is very, uh, very worrying for, for us, for those of us who really want to see Prabhupada's mission um, moved forward. I, um, 
I often use my stepfather as kind of um, well, what word to use um, as an example of an atypical British man. So he uh, he's from a white working class background. He doesn't do religion. Um, he loves to drink his beer. And no doubt he's watching the football this week because it's the European Cup and he'll be uh, uh, supporting England. Um, he has no interest in joining anything to do with with Hinduism or or having a guru or anything like that. He's not interested in incense or bells or smells. <laughs> but when you but if you were to explain to him that there's this wonderful philosophy that gives some really good meaning and explanation as to why we suffer, why we're in pain, what happens when we die physically, um, that might be more digestible to him. But he can't see past, he can't see past the Indian presentation of the dotis and the incense and uh, uh, and all of those things. Um, he's also a massive meat eater, unfortunately, and that's, that's, a, that's another issue. But, but I... I use him in my head as an atypical English man um, because the philosophy we know is so life-changing and beautiful and it just makes so much sense mm -hmm. but because it's kind of I don't know if it trapped is the word it's kind of within it's trapped within this Indian culture uh, uh, it, it, people don't people don't have the opportunity to see past the Indian presentation to mm. discover the philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are, and there have been some, I'd say fantastic attempts to present Krishna consciousness to Western people in a way that they feel comfortable, you know, so uh, 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 Kirtan London is one. I think it's still called Kirtan London, where we just we do Kirtan and we chant the holy names and you can wear what you want. <laughs> you can turn up how you want. Um, you've also got Krishna West, uh, which I think has been great for showing Westerners that you don't have to give up your own culture. You know, you can still celebrate Easter and Christmas if you want to. You know, you can still spend time with your mum and dad, if, even if they're not Hare Krishna devotees. Um, and I mean, other initiatives, there's a new preaching center in uh, Perth in Scotland. I was there the other week where it's just, a, you know, you come and sit in the cafe, have a cup of tea and chat. And there's books on the Bhagavad Gita, you know, and and books of Prabhupada. So there are examples of that. But still in Iskon, you've got this mainstream block. It's like a big kind of political block, a big mainstream block where we dress the same. You know, you've got to behave in a certain way. Um, out of interest in terms of ISKCON, how did it look like in the 1970s and, and, and looking like now? Was there a big Indian contingent in the 1970s? No. No, no. Then it was, uh, it was mostly Western. The devotees were mostly from Western backgrounds. Uh, very few Indian yeah. Mm. Mm. how do you think because obviously you you've you've um alluded to it and you're absolutely correct in some parts of the uk there are big iskon temples that that have been successful if if, if you measure success on numbers of people um uh, so examples would be back to Vedanta manor uh, uh, it's gone London to some extent, even that's maybe a bit more cosmopolitan, possibly because of its location. Also, it's gone Leicester, they're kind of big communities, but it's predominantly people from the Indian cultural background. Um, what do you think we could do, um, to, to try and preserve? the essence of Prabhupada's mission? What do you think we could do differently or change to reach out to more Westerners? Um, well, as you said, Krishna West is a good initiative um, and they are trying many things. 
they're having meetings and um do you need this room now sorry sorry it's okay i'll pause it so over the years um bhaktivedanta manor has changed a lot uh it's it, it is or it has been your local temple uh you you talked about going to the manor in the 1970s and your father meeting Prabhupada um, at the manor and uh, whenever I visit the manor and I go up to Prabhupada's room or rooms I think about all the conversations that he had there with all those guests and all those disciples over the years. Um, you first went to Bhaktivedanta Manor 50 years ago. Um, <laughs> um, for you how has it changed over the years? Well, it's it's expanded a lot. Um, uh, in the seventies, early seventies, it was um, very very much less devotees. The number of devotees was much less. Um, the number of Indian congregation was very little. Um, so that's expanded a lot. Um, in those days. Uh, devotees were struggling financially as well in the beginning years and um so the um the indian congregation they have been very helpful to um to give generous donations and um in this way the manor has built up um you know it's very well maintained it's built up many programs many different programs and there's a lot going on there so it's it's very busy very bustly um but it's mainly uh, it's become um like the local temple for a huge um indian diaspora of you know many of those um, Indian people, they've become devotees as well. They've taken initiation. They are taking care of the deity worship and cooking and so many different services, festivals, and many, many things. So it's a very, very successful project. Um, the only thing that's missing is the, um, the Western contingency and Western preaching. Unfortunately, because it's become viewed as a Hindu temple, so um, Western people, they come to visit some, sometimes, but um, they don't very often actually get involved or become devotees. They tend to get put off probably, um, or they feel that it's, it's an Indian thing and it's not really for them, for, for Western people. So I... Personally, um, I still consider the manor to be my local temple. I still go there from time to time. Um, but I think because I have kind of evolved and changed over the years as well, that, um, you know, because for many years I felt that, you know, the, the general rule was that we dress in a certain way and we attend all these programs and we um, we just follow what we're told and we don't think too much and we don't try to change anything, uh, otherwise we're troublemakers. And and so, you know, I've, I've grown up now, I, I'm an adult. I mean, I think I should have grown up earlier because I'm quite old now, but finally in my old age, I've uh, I've claimed my freedom, my independence, to be myself. Um, I don't really want to fit in and and sort of play that role of being the perfect devotee who dresses like this and speaks like this and behaves like this and and follows everything to the T. Um, I still, I mean. I still have my relationship with Prabhupada. I still do my service. I chant my rounds. I'm uh, I'm I, I'm even more perhaps serious about Krishna consciousness in a deeper way than before. But um, 
I just prefer to do it in my own way now. And I mainly, um, my main service, my, my most um, va um, precious service to me is my writing. That's how I express myself. I, I want to come on in a moment and ask about your writings uh, uh, because you are an author. Um, but can I just ask about, um, and we talk, we did talk about it briefly earlier, a, a, a document, called, I think it was called the Vision 2020 document. There was a document a number of years ago, obviously pre-2020, the year, where a number of Prabhupada disciples, I, I think, got together to sign a document to air or raise their concerns about the future direction of Bhaktivedanta Manor. Um, you, you're, uh, uh, I think my first question is, are you aware of it? Number two, did you sign it or support it? And number three, do you, know, do you remember what the contents of that document were? Well, they, they, they invited various, some of us to join. I was invited to join that um, committee where they were having various meetings. I declined because I, I, I felt it was a waste of time, actually. It, sadly, I, I didn't feel that anything would change. And ultimately, it seems I was right. Um, but, you know, it was a well-intentioned initiative. Um, they came up with, yeah, a document, like you say, they came up with um, a list of ideas of proposals for change, which I, yeah, I signed my name onto that. But ultimately, as many ventures in ISKCON, um, nothing changed. And um, yeah, it was, a, mm. it uh, faded away, unfortunately. <laughs> Do you remember what some of those proposals were in the document? Uh, hmm. I can't remember precisely. I know I've put you on the spot, so if you don't remember, that's fine. Yeah, um, I think the general, some of the general ideas were to, um, you know, the same thing that we've just been talking about now, to try to broaden it out, try to... Um, become more amenable to uh, to Western people um, and yeah, to make it more in line with um, Prabhupada's vision. Um, that's, that's all I could say in general, but I don't mm. remember any more details now at the moment. <laughs> And I, I've I've met a lot of people like you uh, over the last couple of years uh, that are uh, probably disciples or, or who have been around the movement for a long time and have now decided to kind of just be more independent. And they feel so liberated. Yeah. Free from the shackles of uh, the institution and the cultural and psychological bindings of the institution, you know, and, 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 and uh, I'm trying to think of an example, like, this is a silly example, but I'm going to give it. So I'm from a culture where uh, people hug and hugging's kind of okay. And even I'll even hug uh, my female friends because in my culture, that's okay. But when you you join a movement uh, and for understandable reasons, there might not be hugging that kind of um, sticks with you. And then you feel this kind of like, you know, I don't shake, you know, I do shake hands, but sometimes like I shouldn't shake a hand and I should just be much more kind of, you know, reserved and uh, step back and, and, and humble and meek. And those things are great. But I miss the hugging, for example. And you go to back to Vanta Man and you feel like you've just, you know, be very um, reserved and not express emotions and um you know those kind of things and th those things are important i'm not dismissing them but my culture is very different um many years ago before i joined the harry Krishna movement i was involved with my local church and i can i still go back maybe two or three times a year and despite leaving many years ago i can still go there now they say hey nathan how are you they give me a big hug how are you how's your mom blah 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 what are you up to blah 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 
And I feel so included and welcomed and loved and valued. And they might tr- they might be trying to get me to revert back to following Jesus. I mean, I am, but but they're just so nice. And in this kind of culture that ISKCON might be presenting, I don't feel that intimacy, that love. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I've been going to the man on, on and off for 20 years and I can walk along the corridor and pass someone who's also been going for 20 years and they don't even make eye contact with me. Mm. And I just think, oh, I don't really like it here. I don't feel welcomed. It's Mm. just, it's quite big and overwhelming and noisy. (laughs) And robotic, you know, pay your obeisances, get up, move on. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's become a little impersonal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And one of the things that I've discovered over the last two years through my own research, my own writings, my own savor, is that there's a whole group of people, group of devotees that are following Prabhupada, that have taken shelter of Prabhupada, but are doing so independent from the GBC ISKCON. And I'm... uh, doing a bit of work behind the scenes. I've alluded to it on a few of these podcasts. There's a group, there's a growing network of devotees behind the scenes that are starting to work together more and do things together more that are, uh, there are Prabhupada devotees, not in a, not in a Ritvik way, even though there are a part of, you know, the Ritvik movement is quite big, but not in a Ritvik way, but are coming together. We're chanting together. We're serving together. And I've been doing a bit of work in terms of bringing those groups together because they're all trying to achieve the same thing. Um, And I meet a lot of people um, like you that have been around the movement for a long time. I won't, I'm not going to say her name because I don't have permission, but I interviewed a God sister of yours must've been a year and a half ago um, who, yeah, she's a Prabhupada disciple. So been around for a long time. I was like, oh, I don't like wearing the saris. Can't stand them. You know, I don't like being called Mataji. Can't stand it. You know, I'm just me. I'm just who I am. If they don't like it, tough. <laughs> you know? It's kind of revolutionary spirit. Um, so I'm aware that I, I waffled a bit there, but I meet a lot of more mature devotees like yourself um, that have the same thoughts and feelings and emotions. Um, let's talk a bit about your seva your writings uh so you're an author um tell us about your books how many you've written and and that kind of thing okay well it's not a huge number i've just completed my second book great so but each of these books has taken me about 10 years to write I would say so um, they're quite sort of ambitious projects I suppose and that's why they take a long time because they involve a lot of research and uh, structuring and um, yeah a lot of work goes into them So the first one um, was The Four Goals of Family Life. You might have heard of it. I have, yes, I have. Yeah, so that one was published in 2011. And um, we printed about 20,000 copies of that. Um, And there's, I think there's more than that number actually but um we're not printing it anymore but there are other people who are printing it so with or without permission mostly without unfortunately scary but uh yeah it's still going out there and it it became quite popular um, especially in india and in russia it's been translated in russia and in bengali and uh, yeah So that book was about Grihastha Ashram. It was like a guide for Grihastha Ashram. 
and it was based on Prabhupada's books and on the Vedic scriptures. It was very uh, orthodox, you know. And um, after I'd written that book, I kind of evolved a bit and I became a bit more a bit more liberal and less orthodox, I suppose you could say. Sounds good. Yeah, so the second book is, it's about a similar subject, but it's like a very different kind of approach. Um, instead of being just based on the Vedic scriptures, because, you know, because I'm trying to reach a broader readership rather than just devotees and Hindus and, um, you know, few kind of, a few people who might be interested in that sort of thing. So um, in order to reach a broader readership, I've used a broader um, kind of um, cultural um, sources. I've used a broader range of sources. So instead of just Vedic scriptures, and it's, it's kind of like a way of showing how the the truths the the real truths of life are there in every religion in every mm. country you know how they all um come together how they all connect together so it's about relationships um but also about spirituality and philosophy and psychology and all sorts wow so there's a bit of a th i mean i don't know much about you um but there's a bit of a theme. I look at the things that you've been involved with and there's a bit of a theme. So running Krishna marriage, writing a book about kind of family life, the goals of family life, and now writing a book about relationships. So the whole, there's a whole theme here, uh, uh, which is which is interesting. So I, I could therefore make the assumption that um, uh, you might be married yourself, possibly. Uh, you have a family. Um, and that your experiences as uh, a mother, I know you have children, I think you have, because you can find out anything on Facebook, <laughs> um, your experiences as a, as a mother and a wife have helped you with these, with these savers. Yes, yes. Um, somehow I got into that. I was interested in that. Um, I think what started it off was that my husband and I were quite concerned about the number of divorces that were taking place in ISKCON. And so I wanted to help with that by, um, by taking a lot of material from Prabhupada's teachings about, about Grahasta life and making a, a book. And then, and then because I wasn't at the end of it, after all the work I'd put into it, somehow I wasn't satisfied because I felt it was too um, limited in the sense that it was just from Vedic scriptures and it didn't really, it wasn't really inclusive enough to reach a broad readership. So that's why, that's why I remained on the same kind of theme and topic, but just broadened it out. But the good thing about that is that um, it gives me an opportunity to discuss a lot of other subjects, not just about relationships, although it's based on relationships. The central theme is about relationships and how to um, how to strengthen relationships and how to make them better, how to make them last uh, um, like that. But then within that, there's a lot of discussion about spirituality because really to have a successful relationship, um, to have a, a progressive, meaningful relationship, there has to be a spiritual dimension to that. So that comes into it. Mm -hmm. And and because it's about relationships, of course, also I used a lot of um, um, psychology. I got a lot of, read a lot of psychology papers and uh, philosophy books and it, it's got a lot of quotes in it and all sorts. It's quite uh, quite eclectic, sort of multidisciplinary uh, approach. Mm, mm. It, it sounds like it. And and do you have so your second book is is out? Is it at the moment? 
Um, no, it's actually with some publishers at the moment. My first book was self-published. So the second one, um, I decided to get it published by a, a company. So it's with them at the moment. And so it's just going through the final stages. Um, I'm not sure how long all this is going to take, but um, it should be within a few months. Hopefully it should be. Out. Great. Great. Um, and do you then plan on starting a third book after that? You got thoughts on that? Well, if I do, I think any book that I write after this is going to be much more simple because yeah. this is a, a big, a big mission. <laughs> maybe small, maybe some small, simple books. I would. I was thinking that um, you know when devotees go out on book distribution. And they distribute Prabhupada's books. They distribute lots of Prabhupada's books. And lots of people get Prabhupada's books. But I, I, I just can't help wondering how many people read them and how many people can actually understand them. Mm -hmm. Because they're, you know, they're quite difficult to understand, I think, especially for Western people. Um, so I'm thinking in terms of, like, if I write... Another, if I get a chance to write another book, it will be more like an introductory book that could be um, distributed to um, newcomers. To, I mean, to just the general public. Yeah, hmm. like an introduction to Krishna consciousness and what is the philosophy and. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that sounds good. It's definitely needed. It will definitely, I was going to say, always needed. I mean, I'm thinking of a few other introductory things that uh, that are on my shelf here, and um, there's definitely room for more. Or I want to, I want to. Okay, I use the word improvement. There's room for improvement. Um, I, I'm, I can think of one book, an introduction to Krishna consciousness that was. I'm not going to say his name. <laughs> It was written by a certain ISKCON guru that um, is very good, but is also very, the word I can think of is blunt, it's very blunt. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want I, I want to read a book uh, feeling much more, again, I guess, warm and excited, not so kind of blunt and kind of monotone. Um, um, there is an introductory book in existence. It's, I'm not going to say who it was written by. Um, yeah, so that would be very good. And again, a book that really presents the philosophy to Western people, you know, that in a way that they can easily read and understand. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would be really good, actually. That would be really good. Um, yeah, I, I've uh, I've written a book. It came out a couple of years ago, and I've got another one out this year. But mine are quite different from yours. Uh, my first book was the Harry Christians in Britain, uh, which is about the diversity of the movement in Britain and uh, all the mats and the sanghas and the 1930s. What happened in the 1930s with those Western converts? Uh, so, in one sense, it's quite a warm book. I use that word a lot. Warm. It's quite a warm book, and it's it's about so uh, I would call it kind of interfaith Hare Krishna. You know, how can the different mats and sanghas get on a bit? Um, in my second book, which is which is not so warm, is called Black Magic Booze and Bhakti. Uh, and it's about the struggles that the Hare Krishna movement has experienced over the last 40 years, which include alcoholism or practitioners of the movement. Sorry, alcoholism. Uh, there's a bit on child abuse. There's a bit on black magic. Uh, and effectively, what it is, a lot of the people I've interviewed on this podcast, I'm um, publishing, with their permission, publishing their stories. Uh, so really, in a sense, I'm not writing the book. I'm bringing it. I'm bringing interviews and discussions together. Uh, and, and it'll come out <laughs> later this year, uh, no doubt, with mixed reviews. <laughs> hmm. But... You only live, well, I was about to say you only live once. You don't only live once, but it, it's kind of like you, I want to use this opportunity to make a difference. You know what I mean? And um, I think similar to you, you, you get to that point in your life, well, I just don't really care. I care. Of course I care, but I also don't care anymore. And I need to um, have some principles and values in my life and say what I really think, uh, you know, um, so I think you and I are very similar on on kind of that regard. Um, okay, my final question 
I think you've already kind of answered um, how can we how can we attract more Westerners to Krishna consciousness? Um, I mean, we've kind of talked about that already with maybe Krishna West, but I don't know if you've got any other thoughts on how we can possibly do that at all. Well, I suppose there are many ways. Um, you know, online videos, for example, um, programs like local programs in different places, inviting people to come. And, um, you know, programs like that would have to be tailored in such a way that um, people would be interested and um, they would feel that they could, um, they wouldn't find it something foreign, too foreign. Mm. Um, I mean, there's so many projects that could be done. It's just a matter of um, get, getting some devotees together who are all interested to do this and, um, you know, working together as a team mm. to try to make things happen. Mm. Um, and then, and then just personally, I think the way that we project ourselves when we meet people, there's many ways that we can make a difference in people's lives, but you have to, we have to be able to just connect with people, make friends with people so that they will be interested to listen. So, I mean, that's another way, just in a very casual way, like Lord Chaitanya said that whoever you meet, tell them something about Krishna. Mm. There are different ways to do that, you know, if you meet someone, you're not, you're not going to start saying, well, you know, I'm a devotee of Krishna and Krishna's God. And, you know, you have to actually first connect with a person. And, and then when they become curious, you can s slowly um, introduce them to all these um, concepts. But I'm sure there are so many other ways. Um, it's unlimited, actually, mm. number of things we could be doing so, I mean I've just been writing basically up till now um because I'm I'm I've just been working on my own I suppose um but I'd be open to the idea of working with other people if there was if it was practical if it was something that I could do um and there are some devotees who are trying to come up with ideas mm. and uh, we just need to find ways that we can work together mm. well i think they're great ideas that you've you've suggested and one of the things i've discovered in my own research particularly researching all the different mats in britain is a lot of these things are already happening um and i'm i'm quite pro I don't know if this is the correct term to use. I'm, I'm quite pro map mixing. And, and what I mean by that is we can learn from one another, you know, best practice. And um, I've uh, just discovered, I don't know if I should say their name. Yeah, okay. I've just discovered, uh, I've been aware for several years that the Science of Identity Foundation is in the UK. So the Science of Identity Foundation is the map set up by uh, Chris Butler, uh, Jagat Guru, uh, Siddhas Rupananda in Hawaii. So this is the map that Tulsi Gabbard is in. And through my own research, when I was writing my book, I discovered they were in the UK, but I couldn't, I couldn't connect with them. Their emails were quite short and blunt and they didn't really want to engage with me. They didn't want to be interviewed. And through someone else, actually, I've discovered that they've got uh, a huge Kirtan project in Reading and one in Guildford. And I, they're not obviously, they're not appearing on Facebook as Science of Identity Foundation or Jagad Guru or whatever. They're appearing as something else completely different. And what they're doing is amazing. 
you know, they've, 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 they're chanting the Hare Krishna mantra to a packed Western audience every Friday night. And it's just this much more collaborative, inclusive kind of welcoming initiative. And you find that other projects are doing that as well. Um, when, when idea, uh, so it, here at the Hare Krishna project, so we produce this podcast, but also we do book distribution. We give talks in schools and libraries and, you know, there's a team of us. Uh, we've just been invited to a care home to give a talk about back to yoga, which I'm really excited about. Um, <laughs> and that's coming up in a few weeks. But one idea I've had is because um, I want to learn from other religions as well, what works. And one of the things that Christianity has been very successful at is the Alpha Course. So the Alpha Course was set up in the late 1970s. It's like a 10 week course where you can come along to a local community hall or a church or community center and you, you come on a Monday night, you have a meal, you can chat and you listen to a talk and then you can ask any question you want, no matter how weird it is. And it's been so successful over the last 45 years, 3 million, they say 3 million British people have attended one of these courses. So it's called the Alpha Course, and it's designed in such a way. It used about ten years ago. You you saw it a lot on buses advertised, and on billboards, and on bus stops. And it would say the Alpha Course. If you got questions about life, you know. So the first week, the thing would be, who is God? The second week, who is Jesus? The third week, who is the Holy Spirit? The third week, why should I read the Bible? The next week, uh, what is prayer? Why should I pray? And you can go along as a member of the public. You can ask any question you want. You won't be criticized. You won't be shouted at. You know, you get a free meal, <laughs> which is pretty good. And you can ask any question. You can say, I don't believe in God. I think it's all rubbish. And you can have a conversation about that. And when I was setting up the Hare Krishna project, I wanted to try and achieve or do the same thing. So, yes, maybe we could set up a course called maybe the Krishna course. You can come along. And you can do anything you want. OK, you don't have to wear silly clothes. You can wear your favorite football shirt. Doesn't matter. Anything like that. But I wanted to create this environment where you could ask anyone any question. Like I really this is my personal view. I don't like this approach where you go to a maybe a, a talk with this gone or a meeting and you want to ask a question. Well, but you can't ask that because it's very offensive or you might offend somebody or oh, you can't ask the guru that question because he does. He won't like it. Well, let me ask it anyway and see what he says or she see what she says, you see. And I, I don't like that, you know, how we grow as and we develop as, as as characters. You need to have that environment where you I can ask questions. Hmm. No matter how silly it sounds, it's kind of like when I joined the movement all those years ago and I went home and I told my mum my new diet. She said, well, onions and garlic are lovely. You can have them with anything. They're great seasoning. This is all just silly. Why don't you have onions and garlic? And actually, I want her to have the opportunity to ask that question and be given an answer. That, you know, I want people to feel that, you know, well, why can't I hug my female friends? You know, or, you know, why, why can't I do this? Um, why can't I have sex with my partner and live with them? You know, uh, why can't I? All those questions that, that uh, you know people might have i want to create that environment where they can ask them without being shouted at or accused of being offensive or you've offended somebody mm -hmm. yeah i like it yeah i i did a sometimes i do little short videos for facebook and i i did one about six months ago about Hare krishna people are the most offended people of the world you know, like over the years, I've worked in different businesses I've worked in charities and stuff. And I've I have never met a group of people in the whole world that get offended so easily. And the Hare Krishnas, you know, oh, you've offended my friend, you know, <laughs> and OK, we all get offended. There's things on the TV I don't like. I don't write to the BBC and tell them to take it off. I just choose not to watch it. it it's you know, um so it, I, you and I agree. I mean, I, I, and again, one thing I like to do is create maybe like a, a Krishna course, a 10 week course, come along for a free meal. At the end of the 10 weeks, you can say it's all crazy. You have the freedom to do that. Or you can start, you can take up the lifestyle if you want to. The choice is yours. You know? Hmm. And um, anyway. Sounds like a good idea. 
Yeah. Very good idea. Yeah. Maybe if it's Krishna's will, it will happen. You know, and, and the Alpha Course started in the church in Brompton. I think Brompton's in London. It started in Brompton uh, in the late 70s. So it's in the Church of England, that, that denomination. And it's now rolled out across the country. It's happening in towns and villages across the country. So we could start a Krishna course in northwest London. And within 10 years, it could be happening in 100 community halls around the UK every year, you know. Um, anyway, <laughs> we'll see what happens over the next decade. Um, I'm also conscious, uh, Jagannath Ashwari, that we've been chatting for quite a long time um it's been it's been wonderful to have you as the guest this week on the harry krishna project podcast thank you it's been wonderful to be here and i appreciate your uh honesty and your uh enthusiasm for krishna consciousness it's wonderful and uh i also like your independent spirit which is great um so i'm gonna say goodbye to the viewers at home uh, and then you and I can have a, a, a brief debrief after um, after I've hit the stop button. Um, so a big thank you to uh, Jagannath Eshwari for being our guest on this week's podcast, episode number 129. Uh, a huge thank you to everyone who's tuned in to watch this episode. Do not forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, to hit the subscribe button uh, if you haven't already. So you can be kept updated about future podcasts from the Hare Krishna Project. Um, and if you're watching this on Facebook, if you haven't already, to like or follow the Hare Krishna Project Facebook page. So you can, you can be kept updated that way. I know that whenever I say that, the number of subscribers does go up. So you are listening and it absolutely does work. So I thank you all for um, doing that. So uh, thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And until next week, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Hare Krishna.